nowadays, they usually think of the gig economy. What is the gig economy? Hopping on an app and making some money with your car. Like Uber, Lyft, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Grubhub, Instacart, Shipped, that kind of thing. Well, we're going to actually play devil's advocate in this video slash podcast because we're going to actually be talking about Uber Eats and 10 tips that uh, you can implement if you're going to choose to make money as an Uber Eats driver. This particular episode kind of excites me because it is something I have a lot of experience with. And even though it's changed throughout the years, I do think it is a decent way of making money as long as you do have some kind of exit plan if you're going to do it full time. And if you're going to continue to do it part time, hey, uh, more power to you. It can stay in the side hustle category. But with that being said, let's start this episode of today's podcast. Welcome to the Side Hustler Society podcast with your host, Elijah Bilal. This is where you can find out more about hustles that are best for you. And of course, make more money in the process. Elijah has been in the gig economy and freelance space for over five years and has done over 3,000 deliveries on Uber Eats. He's an Airbnb super host, runs multiple YouTube channels, and is the author of the best-selling book, The Anatomy of Financial Success. It's his mission to empower people with the tools needed to be successful. Now, welcome your host, the king of side hustles, Elijah Bilal. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Elijah Blau. And as y'all saw as part of that intro, I actually do have over 3,000 deliveries on Uber Eats, which kind of qualifies me to know a thing or two about it. I actually have a full YouTube channel about the, uh, I wouldn't say the gig economy nowadays, but early on, it covered a lot of gig economy content, in particular, making money on Uber Eats. Now, there will be some interest exchangeable information because, uh, a lot of these tips that I'm going to give can cross over into other delivery platforms. So a lot of these tips you can use for being a DoorDash driver, um, being a driver for Grubhub, in some cases, even Instacart. But uh, a tip or two might be exclusive to Uber Eats. So just keep in mind that some of these tips are more for just being a delivery driver in general. So if you do drive for another uh, service, many times it can be applicable there too. So swinging back to... <laughs> I'd have to sit down and think of the exact year. But I remember when I first got involved with Uber Eats, I uh, did not start out as an Uber Eats driver in terms of my introduction to the gig economy. I actually started as an Uber driver. And um, I was having fun doing that. And uh, Uber Eats, well, Uber was harassing me about Uber Eats in my market saying, do you want to do Uber Eats? Do you want to do Uber Eats? And this was before they added tipping on the platform. So my answer was uh, no, no, no. But uh, about a month after they stopped, they kept harassing me about it. Like every time I'd open my app to start driving, there was always that question. Uh, they actually brought tipping to the platform. It's part of their 180 day days of change to give the public perception that uh, Uber turned a new leaf after their um, CEO, Travis Calvin, resigned. Honestly, I, I don't think it did much for the perception of the company, but that's another episode entirely. But the point is, they finally brought tipping to the platform. So that's when I decided to give Uber Eats a try. And after a few deliveries, I discovered uh, this magical thing that I was alone in the car. Yeah, that's a big discovery, right? In all seriousness, no. In all seriousness, rather. <laughs> this turned out to be a pretty good advantage based on what I wanted to do. Because I could listen to uh, audiobooks. I could listen to YouTube podcasts, you know, like the podcast you're listening to right now. And uh, just soak up so much information while getting paid in the process. I just couldn't pass that opportunity up. So I started to focus more on driving for Uber Eats over the regular ride share. And over my span of driving for Uber Eats, I learned a few tips that can speed up the process, which means you're going to make more money. Think of it like this. If you can get three deliveries in one hour instead of two, well, that means you're going to make more money per hour because each delivery equals income. So that's why I'm excited to share these tips. Now, before we get started, I want to say that if you're watching me on uh, YouTube, if you could give the thumbs up to the video, it's very much appreciated and consider subscribing 
if uh, you want to be notified on YouTube when the podcast drops. Sometimes visuals are given in the YouTube format of this podcast, but I just did I did just want to throw that out there. So uh, tip number one is to make sure you start your shift with a full tank of gas. Some of y'all might be taking this uh, tip for granted, but uh, I'm guilty of this habit when I first started. But you might get in the habit of each time you need gas, like you go there and you put like five, ten bucks in there, and then uh, you continue on your uh, shift. And when I say shift, I just mean the period of time that you decided to deliver. There's no scheduled shift in uh, Uber Eats or I guess you could say with DoorDash, but uh, you, you can leave any. We're not talking about DoorDash. The point is, you can get online and offline whenever you want. So I don't want y'all thinking shift as in like uh, nine to five. No, that's not the case. It's just when you decide to start driving and then when you decide to stop driving. That's what I refer to as a shift. And a lot of people get into the habit of each time they need gas, they just put five, ten bucks in there. And uh, there's a there's a few problems with that. Uh, number one problem is it's not efficient because each time your wheels are not turning with food in your car and you're making the delivery, you are losing money. And that means it's going to lower your per hour earnings. That could be avoided just by filling up at the pump at the beginning of your shift. Another reason is it can just straight up interfere with the process of uh, making a delivery. It's just another thing that you might end up having to do in between deliveries. Now, that I'm going to elaborate in a later tip. So just kind of put a pause button on that. I do just want to mention it here. So it's just better if you fill up at the pump before your shift starts. And obviously, um, if you need to fill up again, that's another thing entirely. But each time you go, just fill up. Now, I know that's might be challenging in the economy right now with gas prices inflated. But uh, trust me, it's going to work out better. And if you are actually looking for a way to minimize gas prices, I would recommend that you check out the uh, Get Upside app. There'll be a link left for that in the uh, description if you're on YouTube and in the show notes if uh, you're listening to this podcast uh, elsewhere. But Get Upside app is an app that you can use to get cash back per gallon based on uh, whatever deal is going on at the time. So that's uh, something that you can utilize to uh, pay a little less in gas sometimes. You might also want to think about downloading the app called Gas Buddy because it lets you see the gas prices at various stations in the area and uh, which ones have the best deal. So if you combine the two, that can help reduce your gas expenses. So moving on to tip number two. I'm going to have don't use a cash out. Now, that might be kind of tough. Let's explain what cash out is first. So when you start driving for Uber Eats or really any of these uh, delivery apps, after you make a certain amount of money, you have the option to cash out. That certain amount is usually just like 50 cents or like under $5. It's really like not relevant. You're going to make the amount that you can do to cash out. And that basically means as long as you have a debit card on file, you can send those funds directly to your bank account via the debit card. There's an issue with this because the more you cash out, there's a link between the more you cash out and financial mismanagement. The fact that you want, and I have a story to share too, but the fact that you want that money sooner means it's probably going to get spent faster, which means that it's uh, you might end up in this quagmire where you keep driving for money, spending, driving for money, spending. Technically, you want to drive as least as possible, if I'm going to be like 100% honest, because um, obviously there's a depreciation on your car. There's a, You want to maximize the money you make while you're on the platform, and you don't want to have to keep returning. And uh, when you don't spend money as much as fast, you tend to just think about where that money is going to go. When I was cashing out like at the end of every day, I noticed that I would just spend money faster. And when I stopped doing it, uh, I noticed I started saving more money. Things just ran smoother. So I recommend that you don't use that cash out function so much. I mean, what more can I say? So moving on to the third tip, I'm going to have have a delivery bag a big delivery bag at that. So sometimes, uh, well, they don't do it anymore. Uber Eats used to give you a uh, delivery bag. But even still, if a company gives you a delivery bag, I recommend that you still get your own uh, bigger bag for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is the bag that the company gives you may not 
be an all size fit bag. And I remember the days where when I had pizza, that's something that wouldn't fit in the bag, like provided by like DoorDash or well, Postmates isn't a thing anymore. Well, it technically is, but you know, they were bought by Uber, but basically it wouldn't fit in the bag that they, they gave. So I couldn't keep the food heated. So it helps to have a big delivery bag for those uh, instances. And another reason is uh, even if they do give you an appropriate size bag, it usually has their logo on it. And I know we're talking about Uber Eats here, but let's just be honest. Many people are going to sign up and drive for Uber Eats and DoorDash and Grubhub. And, you know, I'm not mad at you. But if it has the logo on it, technically it's against that company's terms of service to promote a competitor while you're working for them directly on a delivery. So you put in this situation where you technically shouldn't be using that bag. And if someone was to report you, uh, you would get deactivated. So why not have a bag that's neutral and doesn't have a logo on it? And uh, I should this should go without saying, but you you need a delivery bag. Some people, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but in 2022, they're still doing delivery and not having a delivery bag. They're complaining that they don't get enough money in tips. Come on. I mean, it doesn't cost that much. Pick one up on Amazon. You know, not a tax advisor, but, you know, you can write it off. OK, that's not technically uh, tax advice, but, you know, maybe I'm just kind of thinking out loud. OK, moving on to the next tip. We're going to swing back to the gas thing. And I recommend that you don't stop for gas while you're on a delivery. So many people get into this delivery industry and they haven't actually used a service before which kind of baffles me. But specifically, well, with all the apps nowadays, but we're going to keep on the topic of Uber Eats. The customer can uh, see you from the moment you uh, they place the order and you uh, you uh, accept the ping. They can see you on this uh, mini map because the app is tracking you. And uh, people get kind of, I think the term is hangry, like when you're hungry and then you get angry easy. And... If they see that you are moving, then you stop, then they zoom in and you got a gas station, they're going to get annoyed. Now, this is if you're driving to the food or driving, uh, you picked up the food and driving to the customer. In both cases, it's bad, but I think it's even worse if you already have their food is click something in them psychologically. Now, why is this relevant? Because uh, two reasons. One, uh, you don't want to get dinged on your satisfaction rate. The satisfaction rate is what keeps you on the platform. If it drops below 85%, then you're in danger of uh, being deactivated off of uh, Uber Eats. And the uh, second and more important thing, because I, I don't think, in my experience, most people aren't that petty to uh, give you a thumbs down because just because you stopped for gas. Most, most people aren't that petty. But it might compromise your tip. You might have uh, been getting a favorable tip, and it might get lowered. Or you might not get a tip at all. Now, keep in mind that in a lot of markets on Uber Eats, you can see the tip ahead of time. But even though you can see the tip ahead of time, a lot of times people are just feeling extra generous and they increase the tip after you've dropped the food off. For a full hour after you've delivered the food, the customer has an option to increase the tip if they want. And a lot of people actually do it. So why give them a reason not to do that? So that kind of fits in with tip number one. Fill up at the pump at the beginning of the shift, and uh, you won't really have this happen as much And uh, in terms of just having to fill up in general. And if you do need to fill up, make sure you do it in between deliveries. Like after you drop that food off, uh, if you need to, pause your deliveries, go get gas, and then uh, put the request back on the screen, if you will. Moving on to the next tip, have a version of a do not do business list. So when you're first starting out, you do need to learn your restaurants that you'll be going to, that you'll be picking food up from. And you need to take note of when are they busy? When do you can make a lot of money from that restaurant? How long are you waiting for the food? And if you're waiting, my number is five minutes, okay? If I'm waiting more than five minutes on a regular basis for an order, they get put on the what I call the do not do business list. That means that if an order pops up and I know it's coming from that restaurant, I just decline because I know I'm going to be there for too long. There are some exceptions. Like if someone, if the order is a total of like $17 or something, I haven't talked about earnings so far, but I tend to 
stay in the range of 11 to 18 dollars an hour that was the range i always gave on the app lifestyle but uh this time around i am more strict it's 15 to 20 dollars an hour so if a number pops up and it's in the double digits I may actually go ahead and take that delivery. You know, it's coming from that restaurant. As long as they don't have a habit of waiting like 30 minutes or something, that's ridiculous. But the reason I'll do it is because I'll take that. And once that's completed, I can still slide another delivery in in that uh, hour. So let's say if an order comes in and I, I'm going to pay $11, I managed to finish all that in like 35 minutes. And then I can slide a 7 or $8 order in there. And guess what? I'm still in my target range. But those are the exceptions to the rule. If a restaurant, people don't tend to tip like a lot for that restaurant and they're slow, they get put on the do not do business list. Now, I update this every month, so I'll be willing to give them another try next month. But for this month, you're out, baby. I will say this, too. Have a do not do business list for different shifts. Now, um... There are different time periods when it's best to do a de be a delivery driver because demand is so high. There's the lunch time, which is between 11 and 2 p.m. There's dinner time, which is between 5 p.m. and 9 p.m. And then there's an overnight, which uh, generally tends to be uh, pretty busy overall because there's just uh, less drivers. And if you want to, you could include the breakfast times of set of 6 a.m to a 10 a.m although it might not be as uh, busy you need to experiment with that but the point is just because a restaurant is swamped during lunchtime and they can't get their stuff together that does not mean that they're going to be swamped at a uh, dinner time they might be doing fine at dinner time and able to get orders out you know fast so that's the reason this should uh, not carry over into different shifts another reason is uh the staff is different so at these establishments, you know, people work in different days. Uh, you got a lot of part-timers. So with the staff being different, they just be maybe more efficient. So make sure you keep that in mind when coming up with this list. And you can actually write this down in your notes section on your phone if you if you need to. Like, for instance, uh, Subway on do not do business this during lunchtime. But during dinner time, they're fine. So you would take a delivery during dinner time. Come up with a version of that list, and it's going to make your life a lot easier, and it's going to – you'll see the difference in your pocketbooks. I'll uh, say that. <laughs> Moving on to the next tip, we have, if you can, arrange for the customer that can meet you at the car. So there's three types of drop-offs. There's the uh, drop-off where you meet the person at the door. You, you take the food up. They uh, physically receive it. That's done. Then there's a drop off where they request to meet you at your car, which means they're going to come to you and pick the food up. And uh, the pandemic made this option appear, which is delivered to the door where you just leave the food on the doorstep or porch or whatever. I think uh, most people are still sticking with that leave it to door model. But in certain cases, like, uh, I don't know, say downtown, if you're staying in a city that has a downtown, you're going to have skyscrapers. And uh, people want you to bring their food up to the 50th floor. All this takes time. So what I do, I have a standard text. The moment I see that they're in a skyscraper or really any version of an apartment that uh, doesn't include like a lot of driving around the apartment complex, like the bulk of the time is going to be spent on foot inside the apartments. Then you're in this elevator going up and then you got to find them and all that stuff. I send this standard text. I say, hi, my name is Elijah. I'm your Uber Eats driver. Would you like to meet me somewhere or do you want me to leave it at your door? Now, the reason I do this is because I send this regardless of uh, if they say they want to meet me at the car already. I won't send that. But if they have the option to meet at door or leave it at the door, I always send it. Why? Because sometimes they say, oh, yeah, I'll meet you downstairs. I'll meet you in the lobby. Or, you know, I'll meet you here. It just saves time as a delivery driver. So I like to give them that choice, even if they put it in there. Because half the time, they may have just left it in there just to leave it in there. But they actually don't mind meeting you. And another time, they may actually plan on meeting you but forgot to update it. So not only do you get clarity on what they want, uh, that's 
the reason I list like, do you want to meet me somewhere first? Because a lot of people psychologically, it only clicks the first thing you say when you give them two options. So it's a little subtle tactic to uh, just speed things up. So having a version of that for yourself can go a long way. Next, we have ranking neighborhoods. So when you've been doing this for a little while, you're going to start noticing uh, patterns. Like certain neighborhoods have a lot of houses. Certain neighborhoods have a lot of apartment complexes. And uh, certain neighborhoods just have a, a mix of both. And some neighborhoods have skyscrapers. When I started noticing these patterns, I just noticed I made more money when I was in certain parts of the city. And I was thinking, why is that? And then I thought about it, like, oh, because in this part of the city, deliveries take longer because of the dynamics that I just talked about. So with that being the case, I divided Dallas in a quadrant. So you got northeast, southeast, oh, northwest, south, uh, northwest, northeast, all that stuff. I didn't mention all the quadrants. You get what I'm going at. <laughs> but I divided them up, and then I... Uh, took note of like what parts had mostly houses, what parts had mostly skyscrapers, what part had mostly apartments. And um, I took note of how much I was making anytime I did a full day in that quadrant. So I put a number next to that quadrant, which is how much I typically make or number range. And I would put like the obstacles that I'm encountering in those quadrants and I would give it a number. And uh, this is how you end up really getting towards the higher end of that spectrum in terms of that range, you know, like around $20 an hour, potentially. Uh, that's all market dependent. But the point is, if you find out what parts of your market have mainly houses, because houses are very, 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 very quick deliveries. You just go there, walk up, uh, give them the food or leave it on the porch and then go back to your car. The whole thing takes like maybe two minutes versus uh, delivering at the skyscraper, which you got to find parking, which could be an issue. And it's so then you got to walk in, then you got to go go up the elevator and then you got to deliver the food that takes five to ten minutes. And then you got to go back down the elevator and go back to your car. That's an additional five or ten minutes. You see how all this starts adding up. So if you're operating in a zone that has mainly houses, well, shoot, you're going to save a lot more time. and You'll be able to do more deliveries in an hour. So in that situation, I'm willing to take less per delivery because i know i can still stay in that range of 15 to 20 dollars an hour meanwhile if i'm delivering to downtown well this is where unless the customer is going to come and meet me which i don't ever assume that they are i'm going to assume that they're not they are going to have to you know subsidize that this delivery is going to take a total of like 35 minutes and that tip needs to be higher so once you have your market divided up like this you can set your expectations and then you can just have an idea of uh, how much you're going to make anytime you're in a certain place. Another thing to keep in mind is also the time of day. Like the dynamics of uh, lunchtime are going to be different from dinner time. Lunchtime, you're going to be delivering to people that are working. So does that part of the city mainly have like one story buildings where people are working or are they in skyscrapers? These are things to consider. Swinging on to the next tip. Well, before I move on to the next tip, I will say that that was probably the biggest tip that took my earnings from like, you know, 11 to $16 an hour to between 15 to $20 an hour, sometimes exceeding $20 an hour on a consistent basis. If I had to rate these tips, I say that was the number one tip that really allowed me to take my Uber Eats game to the next level. So moving on to the next tip, which is use the customer app so it baffles me how many people know very little about the uber Eats customer app but it's a a gem if you just use it you can get a lot of information from the customer app so you can tell how long a delivery will take you can tell exactly how expensive a restaurant is by the dollar symbols and the ones with over two dollar symbols tend to have the better tippers versus these restaurants that just have $1 symbol shows that they're more of a budget restaurant. So you probably shouldn't be expecting huge tips from that scenario. Not to say that it can't come, but it allows you to kind of plan things, if that makes any sense. It also lets you know what restaurants deliver very far. 
And if you don't want to go far, well, maybe you should avoid that restaurant. And this information is particularly good for newbies. But if you don't know where restaurants are partner with Uber Eats, how do you know like where to wait in your market? <laughs> I mean, I tend to set up shop in between a bunch of restaurants because it increases your chances of uh, getting deliveries. So if you're new, you don't have any information yet. So one thing you can do is whip out that customer app and see what restaurants are available. And you can kind of formulate a game plan from there. Now, keep in mind, this game plan probably needs to be modified based on uh, what restaurants are most popular, what restaurants are bringing the most deliveries uh, once you get enough experience to know that. But uh, starting out, you don't. So you're just going to turn your app on and kind of hope for the best. You can go ahead and start formulating like where you want to strategically place yourself by just looking at the customer app and seeing like what restaurants are where. And if you're fairly familiar with the area, you know, oh, well, this McDonald's is here. Oh, this uh, Popeye's is here. In fact, the franchises and like the fast food franchises tend to have the name of the street that they're on. So that's also helpful. Customer app, very underrated. And uh, while we're on the topic, those of y'all that haven't used the service yourself, use it at least once see it from the customer's perspective and it will give you a lot of clarity on how to be a better driver i mean seriously moving on to the next tip uh track your mileage so this is something i avoided when i first started well not uber eats i avoided when i was being an uber driver thank god when i started doing uber eats i was already in the process of tracking my mileage but uh, it was just something i just didn't want to mentally think about and I didn't plan on doing it that long. So maybe I was like, well, I'm not going to do it long enough to worry about that kind of stuff. Well, I was leaving money on the table because the IRS, assuming you're going to use a standard malice deduction at the end of the year when taxes come, they let you uh, write off a certain percentage per mile. It's usually between 50 and 60 cents per mile that you're driving to the restaurant. And when you're on deliveries, I was leaving money on the table because those mouths that are just left on the table before I started tracking, it's dead to the wind. And I recommend that you use some other app, well, some app to track it. I use Stride. Uh, some people use uh, the Mileage IQ app. Whatever you want to use to track it. Now, Uber will give you a total amount of mileage at the end of the year that can be used, but they don't include the total amount of time that you are online. So um, I wouldn't use that because you're still leaving money on the table. I mean, why give Uncle Sam a bigger check than they need? They put these things in the tax code for a reason, to incentivize certain things. So take advantage of them. Don't be like me and just brush it off. And then like after three and a half months, you decide to go ahead and start tracking it, which means that you're losing out on money. Don't be like me when I started out. Just go ahead and start tracking right off the bat when you – Get in the car, turn whatever app that you're going to use on, and then when your shift ends, turn it off. Now for the final tip, which brings us at tip number 10, that is to have a clear exit plan. So my original plan was to do Uber Eats long enough to get this YouTube stuff off the ground and then build a personal finance channel. That's quite literally what I did. I mean, financial anatomy is now considerably bigger than the app lifestyle and as of the time of the recording in this video it brings between 15 and two thousand dollars per month without me having to do anything because has a bunch of evergreen content but that didn't happen by accident that was intentional so the reason i say that uh, a game plan is a uh, not a game plan the reason i say to have an exit plan is a lot of people uh, end up doing this stuff for a period of their life where like let's say they lost their job or they just needed money, then they get a little too comfortable with it, in my opinion. We're going to talk about its full-time potential and removing the side from the word hustler and just becoming a hustler in this industry in a sec, but just have an exit plan. Too many people are floating out here doing this without an exit plan. I'm going to be honest and say that it's not sustainable long-term, so whatever you uh, want to do, you need to go ahead and start building it. Do you want to build a business? Do you want to go to school and get a degree or something? Do you want to get a trade? Like, what is the game plan? Make sure you have some kind of exit plan, because can you see yourself doing this in 20 or 30 years? I would hope the answer is uh, no. So 
Elijah, what is the full time potential of this particular side hustle? I would say uh, don't do it full time. I don't think that uh, you can make enough money to build a sustainable living on it, at least not at this time. Uh, before you could, but some things have changed to where you have to put more effort in to make that money. And I don't personally think it's worth it long term. So if you decide to do this full time, uh, this is just amplifying tip number 10. Have an exit strategy. Like, what are you doing this for? Because one thing this will give you, it will give you freedom and flexibility to pursue something. But I would do it for maximum six months to a year uh, full time. After that, whatever you're doing needs to uh, be taken off. The only exception is if you're in college and you just want to make some money in the meantime conveniently. Obviously, if you're in college, you might be going to a two year degree or a four year degree. So that's a little different. But every other scenario, like six months to a year. But I think this is a great side hustle. I mean, make an extra two to five hundred dollars per week doing it um part time i think that's actually a pretty decent deal especially since uh this falls under the category of unskilled labor and a lot of people give unskilled labor a hard time but one thing about unskilled labor is it's not mentally taxing in fact oh sorry bumped into the mic in fact not only is it not mentally taxing but you can be enhancing yourself mentally by listening to something Audiobooks, listening to the Side Hustle podcast, hack, hashtag uh, plug in, but not just my podcast, but other podcasts and things that can just enhance you in so many areas of life. So that's a big advantage to unskilled labor, and that applies in uh, this case. So make sure you have an extra plan. If you're going to do it full time, give yourself a timer of six months to a year to get whatever you need off the ground, and then you can move forward from there. And uh, keep in mind that uh, you could be trying to get another side hustle off the ground. It doesn't have to be like some full time. Let's say you're training to be a photographer. Well, you're doing this uh, full time so you can uh, get the camera gear to get your photography business off the ground or, you know, learn how to be a photographer. Or if you're trying to be a video editor uh, while you're learning the software and getting clients, you're doing this, then eventually that side hustle can be what you do full time. So it can be a pathway to uh, doing another side hustle, just uh, food for thought. But with that being said, we're going to go ahead and end this episode of the podcast. I would ask that if you found value in this podcast, if you're on YouTube, give us a like. It's very much appreciated. And subscribe so you'll be notified when another video drops on, uh, uh, on the YouTube version of the podcast. And if you found value in the podcast, Shoot us a review on whatever platform that you're listening to the podcast from. This has been Elijah Blau, the king of side hustles from the Side Hustler Society. I will catch you in the next video. Be safe and profitable, everyone. This episode may be over, but your hustling journey has just started. Visit the SideHustleSociety.com to access all links and resources mentioned in the show that will help you on your hustler's journey.